Good morning, everybody. We're going to get underway. If I can ask those of you who haven't yet grabbed a seat to find one, we have some. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. I'm uh, Paul Grogan, the uh, president of the Boston Foundation, and uh, certainly, uh, uh, without question, it's going to be a very interesting day in our city. But we think this forum is part of uh, what makes it an interesting uh, day uh, as well. Um, the Boston Foundation, I think, as most of you know, is Greater Boston's uh, Community Foundation. We're a nearly 100-year-old uh, charity uh, devoted to the betterment of Greater Boston. We'll celebrate our centennial in 2015. Uh, over that span of time, we have provided nearly $2 billion in grants to Boston area nonprofits, and more than three-quarters of a billion of that has come in just the last uh, 10 years. Uh, our interests as a community foundation are very broad. We're involved in uh, arts and culture, health care, uh, economic development, neighborhood revitalization, um, energy conservation, a host of issues. But what's at the top of the list for us, what has been and what will continue to be for the foreseeable future, uh, is education. And the Boston Foundation is interested in the entire education pipeline from early childhood uh, to early uh, adulthood. Uh, many of you know that uh, we've been deeply involved in the effort to uh, restructure K through 12 education, to uh, uh, bring in more charter schools, but also enable regular district schools to take advantage of the lessons of the charter schools. And it's a very, very exciting time in, uh, in education in Boston. And the two mayoral candidates certainly have emphasized uh, what is going to be uh, their tremendous commitment to education. Uh, as, as uh, the winner takes, uh, uh, takes office. Um, we, we know, although education is something like a religion in Massachusetts, that we have never uh, been a national leader in supporting public higher education in Massachusetts. We just have not had the passion for it that other states have had. We've had many outstanding institutions and, and accomplishments, but I think that's a fair statement. Uh, and part of that is that uh, because of the history of the region, uh, we have been blessed with some uh, old and, and uh, you know, remarkable uh, private institutions, uh, certainly, you know, Harvard at the, at, the, at, the top of the, at the top of the heap. But we've come to realize in recent years that having those storied private institutions, and, and it's great to have them, is not the full answer for uh, higher education in the Commonwealth. Because if you look at where the graduates of public and private institutions know now, it's been very, very well documented that the workforce of Massachusetts, the leadership of Massachusetts in government, in business, in the nonprofit sector is by and large going to come out of our public institutions. So for us not to be seeking to have the best possible, best supported, most high performing public higher ed system is insane. Um, but how do you do that? What's the path forward? We were very, very excited uh, uh, a while ago, several years ago, when Richard Freeland uh, uh, gave us the concept of the Vision Project as a way forward to hold higher ed more accountable, to have it be much more transparent in terms of what it was accomplishing, but to have that performance and accomplishment make a much stronger case uh, for support. Uh, from the public sector uh, than had uh, been the case. And so we have been enthusiastic supporters of the Vision Project uh, from, from the uh, inception, and we're excited to be the setting for the update on the, on the project that we're going to get from Commissioner Freeland uh, in a moment. Many of you also know we have some wonderful representatives of this uh, a branch of public higher education, uh, the community colleges. The Boston Foundation has been deeply interested in uh, uh, helping our community colleges become the highest performing in the nation and the best supported, uh, which they have not been. Uh, but we're very, very excited about what the legislature did in this l last session to bring increased support uh, for uh, the colleges and very excited about uh, the community college presidents and, and the leadership they're exhibiting, the way they have embraced this unprecedented opportunity uh, to build support uh, for our indispensable community colleges. So uh, this is a, a big work in progress, but we're very excited about the attention it's getting 
and the progress that has been made uh, uh, to date. By the way, this forum, uh, which is one of many forums that the Boston Foundation hosts in the course of the year under the banner of Understanding Boston, is supported by the Civic Leadership Fund, an annual fund at the Boston Foundation. I see a number of contributors to that fund in the audience. Thank you very much. And for those of you who would like to contribute, you can find out how to do so uh, on our website. Uh, the program today will be, of course, first we're going to hear from uh, Commissioner Freeland. Um, after that, uh, Mary Jo Meisner, our Vice President for External Affairs, is going to bring our outstanding panel. We have uh, three uh, uh, college presidents uh, joining us uh, to explore more deeply uh, the issues in the Vision Project, and then uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity for open Q&A, and we'll have you out of here by 10.30, uh, as is our uh, custom. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Richard. He is, of course, the Commissioner of, of Higher Education for Massachusetts, uh, who was appointed to that position in January 2009 by Governor uh, Deval Patrick. Uh, a lot of us got to know Richard, though, uh, during his 10-year uh, presidency of Northeastern University from 1996 to 2006, um, and uh, it was a transformational uh, presidency, which uh, uh, turned Northeastern into a nationally selective residential university with a high achieving student body, increased enrollments uh, from beyond Massachusetts and New England, improved graduation rates, and enhanced uh, economic uh, stature. Uh, we've worked with Richard in, in many capacities over the years, and it's a pleasure to welcome him back to the Boston Foundation. Commissioner Richard Freer. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you for, uh, for the great support. Thank you for uh, making the speech I was going to give about uh, the importance of public higher education. You can see from Paul uh, Grogan's speech what a fantastic partner uh, the Boston Foundation has been, and this forum is just one more example of it. So thank you for hosting us. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for all the support over those several years that we've been working together. Uh, thank you all also for coming, all my colleagues in public higher education, uh, we are here to show unified support for this effort that, uh, that Paul has just described. I, I have always believed and continue to believe that our strength uh, is in unity. Our strength is in having some common messages. Our strength is in having shared commitments and being able to say to the people of Massachusetts, this is what public higher education is delivering for this, for this state. And I appreciate everybody being here to help make that point, and my colleagues uh, on the panel for helping me uh, present this here today. Thanks also for people outside higher education for being uh, here today, for your interest uh, in what we are doing. Uh, we know that at the end of the day, uh, our support uh, from the legislature, uh, our support from the administration will reflect the extent to which the broad public understands our importance to the state and sends that message to our political leaders. So thank you for being here. And we hope you'll take away from this uh, an importantly enriched sense of why investment in public higher education is so important. So today uh, is the a public rollout of this Section Vision Project report. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we have been at this Vision Project report. I'll talk a little bit in a moment more about what that's about. Uh, since 2010, it's a multi-year effort. It is ongoing. Part of the Vision Project report is to report annually. Part of the Vision Project idea is to report annually to the people of Massachusetts how well we are doing at meeting our goals of national leadership and key educational outcomes, to hold ourselves accountable for achieving excellence and achieving national leadership. Because the fundamental idea uh, is that uh, public higher education has become critically important the future of Massachusetts in a way that it was not uh, historically, that that requires a change of thinking about the importance of public higher education across the state, deep in the body politic, and at the highest levels of leadership. Uh, and it is our job to shoulder that responsibility, to act as though we believe excellence is critical, to set aspirational goals, to report how we're doing and achieving those goals honestly and with candor, as you will see. Uh, and then expect and hope and believe that that message of the need for excellence will cascade out through the body politic back into the legislature and translate into the kind of support we need to achieve sustained excellence in public higher education. That is the basic idea behind the Vision Project. So today, 
is the public rollout of our second annual report. We, we introduced the first annual report last year at a wonderful event at the State House. Uh, today is the second uh, public rollout. Um, Boston Foundation uh, is, honoring, is honoring us by hosting this. Uh, they have been great partners. We thank them once again for this further manifestation of their support. The in-house rollout of the Second Vision Project report occurred at a wonderful summit, a wonderful system-wide gathering we had a couple of weeks ago out in Marlboro uh, to share the results of our second year of work uh, with colleagues in public higher education and to come together to talk about what we are doing campus by campus by campus across the system to achieve the kind of excellence to which we aspire. And so I want to begin my remarks with a brief video uh, highlighting some of the uh, activities of that, uh, that wonderful summit. So if who's ever in charge of the video could roll that tape, I'd appreciate it. Our public campuses are working together. Our public campuses have set excellence as the ultimate objective to which we're all striving for in the landscape that we have all worked on in the past is very different today. I'm a big believer in the Vision Project. The Vision Project is a part of our plan. Uh, we've been focused on student learning, workforce alignment, and, uh, and we're excited to be part of this. And we're excited to be held accountable. Because the big challenge we face today, unlike 30 years ago, is that amazingly large numbers of people today who are the first to go to college are not succeeding. They may get into college, but they're not graduating. And one of the issues is many have to start with either remedial math or with remedial English. I saw, I saw where you got maybe a third or more having to start at that level. And the probability of somebody who starts in those remedial courses right now graduating with a four-year degree is at lowest, below, well below 0.2. So the question I would ask you is this. Do you know the probability of a student from a first-generation background or somebody who is Hispanic or somebody who is Asian even uh, What's the probability of their starting in chemistry on your campus for the two-year program or for the four-year and actually succeeding? Most places need to go and do the, do the analysis. They've not done the work. And what you're going to see is, I'm telling you, I don't care how good your place is, you're not where you want to be. Having an opportunity to collaborate with my colleagues, especially the ones who were all thinking about the same things and trying to tackle the same problems and like, how did you do it and sharing and sharing ideas. I mean, the major takeaway is the buzz in the room. There's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of goodwill. I think the Vision Project has really galvanized people on campuses uh, who are interested in improving higher education, all in the service of our students. As I look at the good work going on in Massachusetts, I see a set of institutions that are moving the needle forward, each in their own way, but with commonality of purpose and agreement on final outcomes. This is an extremely positive message. The fact that this decentralized federation of institutions is able to coalesce around a major initiative with many moving parts and promote a statewide agenda for public higher education is quite remarkable. Speaking with a single voice, these institutions have managed to collectively articulate a higher education vision for the Commonwealth and are moving the agenda forward on their own terms. It cannot go unnoticed that the reinvestment in public higher education that has occurred in the Commonwealth over the last few years is partially attributable to this coherent and systematic messaging. And that the challenge we really face today is scaling some of these best practices across the system, taking the best that we've learned on each one of our campuses and scaling it across the system so that we can move the whole system forward and move the aggregate. Uh, statistics. Uh, so today's event uh, is therefore uh, an opportunity to look back at the past and see how much we have accomplished and I think I think that is an extraordinary record but also to look forward and see how much work we still have to do but looking forward empowered by the knowledge that we are succeeding that we can get to where we want to be that it is simply a matter of sticking with it and using what we know best and what we know works. I challenge you, Massachusetts, to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. 
Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny, dreams, and values. You are special, Massachusetts, and you can be even better. Thank you all. that you probably did not recognize was that of a Freeman Hebrowski, the president of the uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, exhorting us to stay the course and make a habit of the excellence to which we are aspiring. And that is really what we're doing, making a habit of excellence. 450 people from every public campus gathered together in Marlboro with the single purpose of elevating public higher education. It was truly a, uh, an uplifting experience. Uh, so today is the public version of that Marlboro event uh, with many uh, members in the audience who are not part of public higher education. So let me begin at the beginning. What is the Vision Project? What is this all about? Uh, I have mentioned, Paul has stressed, that this is an aspirational effort across all of public higher education to achieve national leadership as a public system, national leadership among our community colleges, national leadership among our state universities, national leadership at the level of the University of Massachusetts, our public research university. What does that mean? What does that mean? The uh, six vision project outcomes listed here are the concise definition of what it means. We need to be national leaders in each of these six outcomes mentioned here. We believe that if we can authentically claim national leadership in real measurements on these metrics, we can then say we are doing all we can to provide Massachusetts uh, with a national leading system of higher education. So college participation. We need to be sending more young people on to college than other states. More people need to be coming out of our high schools and going on to college than other states. And when they get to college, they need to be ready to do college level work. That's number one, national leadership in college participation. They need not only to get into college, they need to complete college. They need to complete a certificate or a degree or a high value program and come out of college with something they can use in the marketplace. So we need to be national leaders in college completion at every segmental level. We not only need to be leaders in college completion in the sense that students walk away with a certificate or a degree, but we need to know that the level of learning they're walking away with is also at national leadership, but it's not good enough just to have a piece of paper in your hand. You also need to be empowered by competence and empowered by skills and empowered by knowledge. And we want to be sure we know that we are doing the best possible job at that. Uh, we need to know that our programs are aligned with the nature of the Massachusetts economy so that our employers are receiving the kind of workforce they need and that our young people know that they have opportunities to engage in the kind of economy that is out there waiting for them. Are our programs more aligned with the needs of our economy than the programs of other state systems? We, we want not to focus just on preparing future workers, but we also want to, we want to uh, focus on preparing citizens. We want to be sure we pay attention to the whole student. We all know the importance of that in higher education, so a whole component of the Initiative Project is focusing upon education for citizenship. And finally, and crucially, in cutting across all of those other outcomes, we need to close the truly unacceptable and even, I would say, disgraceful achievement gaps that we have so long tolerated in public higher education in Massachusetts. That is gaps between people of color and majority white people and gaps between people of upper income levels and more modest means. Uh, we, we have lived for years uh, with differential opportunities across those boundaries. Massachusetts will not be where it needs to be in the future unless we can close those achievement gaps. So national leadership in each of the six areas of the Vision Project is what we are all about. That is our definition of our goal and our purpose for Massachusetts. Why are we doing this? Paul mentioned some of this. Uh, Massachusetts uh, has a transformed economy in my professional 
lifetime. When I started out at the University of Massachusetts, Boston in 1970, there was still a robust manufacturing component to our industry. There were, there were blue collar jobs. You could support a middle class life. You could support your family working with your hands in a factory. That has been slowly disappearing as we know over the last 30, 40, 50 years. It continues to disappear as the knowledge-based economy replaces it, as the innovation-based economy, as the high-tech economy replaces it. Today, Massachusetts has the most knowledge-dependent economy in the country and probably one of the most knowledge-dependent economies in the world. We rank number one among all the states in terms of the percentage of our jobs that require a college degree. Where is that workforce going to come from? Where are we going to get those college-educated workers? We know that we don't have a lot of in-migration from other states. In fact, we have an out-migration of college-educated young people, as we know. The great private institutions on which we have historically depended for so much of our talent have more and more become national and international Students, take Northeastern as an example. My beloved Northeastern. 20 years ago, Northeastern was every year producing thousands of engineers and business leaders who were going to make their lives in Massachusetts. Today, Northeastern is a national and international institution. Those students, some of them are staying here, but a large percentage are decamping for other states, even, even other countries, because there are many international students. Over this period of time, public higher education has become increasingly the place where the workforce of the future, as Paul said, is being educated. That is a massive change. Uh, at the same time, public policy with respect to public higher education has not caught up with this changed universe. Public policy continues to fund Massachusetts uh, at about an average level, which is where we have historically been. Uh, we, we bounce around between in the middle ranges among the states, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, sometimes in a good year we come up a little bit. I'll come back to that story uh, at the end. But typically that, that's where we are. We, we have never believed that Massachusetts needs excellence in public higher education. Our message today is, today is different. Today we need excellence and we need that in a serious way. It is our future and to do that we need to invest in it because low funding inevitably compromises quality. You can only do so much with smarts and hard work and we're doing a lot with smarts and hard work and we have been doing a lot with smarts and hard work in a long period of time but there is a limit. There is a limit to what you can do. At the end of the day you need uh, competitive funding if you're going to have a competitive system and our presidents and our institutions are constantly faced with this dilemma of do we invest in quality, do we charge what we need to charge to invest in quality because of limited state support, or do we keep our, our costs down so that students have access? We are in a constant vice between aspiring to quality and maintaining affordability. We need to get out of that vice so we can maintain affordability and also invest in quality. So the Vision Project is the way forward to recognize that there is a new reality in Massachusetts, a new day in Massachusetts, and excellence in public higher education is now the key to our future. In short, Massachusetts needs the best educated citizenry and workforce in the country. That is the mantra of the Vision Project. Massachusetts needs the best educated citizenry and workforce in the nation. And that is not just a slogan. That is not just a tagline. That is a statement of reality. If we are going to have the workforce we need, we need the best educated citizenry and workforce in the nation. And it is the job of public higher education to achieve that. So that gets us to the Vision Project. I've described what it is. Uh, how are we doing with respect to those uh, six uh, educational goals that I mentioned? One of the things that the Vision Project does on its data collection and analysis side, and this is where the Boston Foundation has been so helpful, is to, is to develop metrics to compare the performance of Massachusetts to other states. That's new. We've never seen, I don't think any of you have ever seen a report in television saying, how is Massachusetts doing compared with other states in these key educational outcomes? So we have put that, uh, that data together to the, to the best extent that we can. And what I wanted to do now is sort of report to you how we are doing uh, in each of those six Vision Project outcome areas uh, in comparison with other states. 
college participation. Uh, we like to say Massachusetts has the best educated uh, citizenry right now. That's true. Uh, we have the highest percentage of uh, working adults with college degrees of any state in the nation. So can we rest on our laurels? Uh, absolutely not, uh, for two reasons. W one is, uh, as the uh, older generation passes through and the younger generation comes on, unless we keep that up in the public sector, we run the risk of losing that national leadership. But more important than that and more urgent than that is the fact that so many of the young people coming out of our college today are not prepared for college level work. So yes, we send uh, a high percentage of our young people on to college today, but uh, many of them end up in remedial courses and many of those who end up in remedial courses never achieve a degree. And on top of that, the achievement gaps in participation are, as I said before, a disgrace. Uh, large gaps between students of color uh, and majority students, large gaps between low-income students and, and uh, more affluent students. Unacceptable in terms of social equity, but unacceptable in terms of the future of the Commonwealth. We need those young people to be well-educated and to be productive. So big challenges both in terms of college participation and college readiness. How are we doing, how are we doing on that? Uh, despite those sobering statistics, the message in this report is that we're on the case. We understand the issue. We have a strategy forward. Success is within our sights. That is the meaning of the title of this report. Even though the numbers are disturbing, success is with, within our sights. We are working through this uh, multi-state park initiative. Some of you may have heard of that. Uh, to align our expectations in college more closely with those of high schools. One of the big problems we face in terms of preparing young people in our high schools for college is the fact that, uh, that K through 12, as you know, in, in, in Massachusetts lives and dies by MCAS. In higher education, we don't pay any attention to MCAS. We don't even know what scores students get on MCAS when they apply for our, our institution. So they show up on our doorstep and we give them a placement test. And that placement test has no relationship to what, they, what they've been tested on in high school. We give them a test called AccuPlacer. Uh, so even students who've passed MCAS and presumably met the standards that we've established for them in high school place in high numbers into remediation. That's a terrible failure of our educational system. We need much more cross-sector collaboration to have shared metrics and shared expectations. That's what we are getting toward. Uh, this spring, we will roll out the first iteration of these new park standards. So this is, this is near at hand. On top of that, we are reaching out uh, to students of color to enroll them more actively uh, in public higher education. That wonderful picture that you see on this slide is the bus to college at Holyoke Community College. Holyoke has a bus. It sends that bus to downtown Holyoke every day to pick up kids who have no other way to get to the campus. It buses them free out to the campus so they can get a college education. Enrollments. Latino enrollments at Holyoke Community College have gone up by 30% as a result of this kind of outreach. Same thing at Northern Essex Community College. So we are working actively to close the participation gap with, stu with students of color. So success in national leadership and college participation is within our sights. What about college completion? Here once again, we're doing okay, we're not doing great. Our numbers are sort of in the middle of the packs. Some segments a little, little above the average, some segments a little below the average, but basically uh, in the middle of the pack. And, and uh, over the last five years, those numbers have not moved very much at all. There's a whole data section of the, of the version project report which shows trend data over the last five years. What are we doing about that? Uh, we're, we're focused on it. Campuses are studying their students. The key to this, as Freeman Habrowski said, I hope you caught that reference, is you got to know your students. You got to study your students. You got to understand who's succeeding and who's not succeeding. And you got to figure out why individual students and groups of students are failing or succeeding and then target interventions for them. And we're doing that all over public higher education. We are very focused on changing remedial education uh, because remedial education is not working. The failure rates are enormous. We're losing many too many students. So just this month, the Board of Higher Education began consideration of a whole reform package, particularly focused on math developmental education based on national research of what, what is best practice in this arena. You're going to see a whole new approach to developmental education in, uh, across our public system over the next years. And finally, we are very focused on this issue of movement through the system 
as students move from two-year to four-year institutions, as they move from two-year to two-year or four-year to four-year, even four-year to two-year, does the system make it easy for them to move around or does it throw up obstacles? Do they lose credits as they move across those boundaries or can they, can they contain, retain all or most of their credits? We, we are working toward a universe in which there is maximum portability of credits, maximum uh, facilitation of student progress across the system, once again, to increase college completion rates. So here again, we believe that success is within our sights. And the report uh, highlights two campuses, uh, University of Massachusetts Lowell and Framingham State University, who've shown that this can be done. They've in increased their graduation rates dramatically over the last four or five years by just the kinds of interventions I, I described here. So once again, we believe that success is within our sights. What about student learning? You know, this is really something about public higher education. I've been in this business 45 years. Public, higher education, public and private, has never, ever accepted the responsibility of saying to the public what students know when they graduate. What do we know about a student graduating from any college, including Harvard? That they've got 120 credits in 30 courses. And God knows what that means in terms of quality, in terms of knowledge. It's all over the map. Today, the public is asking us, what do, these, what do these young people really know? What can they really do? There's a lot of skepticism out there about that. What means do we have to report on that? Right now, all we really have uh, is data on uh, performance and graduate uh, record exams or professional licensure exams, particularly for students coming out of two-year institutions. We need to do better than that. So Massachusetts is today, this is a wonderful story, leading a nine-state collaborative designed to, develop, to actually develop a system to measure in numerical terms in ways that can be reported and understood publicly and compared across institutional and state lines what students know and are able to do when they graduate from college, not by using a standardized test, which people in higher education simply reject out of hand, is much too simplistic an approach and where we've had mixed results, I think it's fair to say, in terms of the implications of the MCAS standardized test, but based on evaluations of authentic student work but translated into a real scalable metric uh, that has the potential to revolutionize pu uh, higher education, public and private, in terms of how we understand what our students know and are, are able to do. We are about uh, 12 months away from a nine-state pilot project uh, to, uh, to roll out that new model. So I'm very, very excited about that. I think here again, success is within our sights. On workforce alignment, uh, these are some worrisome numbers. One, once again, we don't believe we are producing the number of graduates we need, either in specific high need fields like healthcare and high tech, or more broadly, just in terms of the number of college graduates that this economy is going to need. We are, we, are, we are projecting shortfalls in the number of college graduates that that economy of ours is going to require. Uh, but we are also on the case as well. Here, uh, Paul mentioned uh, this community college uh, transformation, which has been uh, mandated by the legislature and embraced by our leaders, involving many components. You may have seen an editorial in the Boston Globe uh, on Sunday about one aspect of that, which is a new formula for funding community colleges embraced by the president, where 50% of the annual budget allocation will be driven by performance on vision project metrics. So we, we have adopted the most aggressive performance-oriented budget formula for community colleges of any state in the nation. Uh, and that is only a part of what the community colleges are doing. They want a $20 million grant uh, from the uh, Department of Labor called the transfer, uh, to fund what they call the transformation agenda, which is aligning their programs all across the system more closely with the opportunities that employers provide and the needs of the students they serve. Uh, we are working our way through the Massachusetts economy sector by sector to have a real strategic plan for public higher education in each area. What are we going to need in healthcare five or ten years from now? What are we going to need in IT? What are we going to need in life sciences? And then working with the employer community to make sure that our programs are aligned with those needs. Uh, we are also focused on closing these achievement gaps within our workforce oriented programs and the Vision Project report. Uh, uh, within our sites highlights uh, two examples uh, at uh, Bridgewater State uh, and at Massasoit Community College where, where through, uh, through innovative initiative we actually have closed the achievement gaps between students of color and white students in those majors. We know it can be done. 
uh, preparing citizens. This is an area that higher education has basically walked away from in our lifetimes. You know, there was a time when colleges and universities thought preparing citizens was really important and worked at it. We still say it's really important, but we stopped working at it a long time ago. Uh, there are very few institutions which have any systematic, pay any systematic attention to this goal. Massachusetts said that's not good enough for Massachusetts. We want to be national leaders. We want to take that goal seriously. And so we are the only state in the country which has made systematic focus on producing well-educated, civically engaged young people a part of a statewide strategic plan. The only state in the nation that has done that. The, the report from the from a task force that President Squino, who's here uh, uh, today, uh, chaired is before the Board of Higher Education as we speak. Uh, we are looking to make sure that every public campus in the system is dedicated to that goal. Finally, closing achievement gaps. Uh, where do we stand? Uh, I've mentioned success stories. I've mentioned success stories reaching out to students of color, particularly the Latino community at, at Holyoke Community College in Northern Essex. I've mentioned successes uh, in uh, closing achievement gaps uh, in STEM areas at Massasoit and Bridgewater. There are successes, but the, there are more strikingly deep, persistent, ongoing inequities across every one of these vision projects outcomes. And so we, we are working on this difficult matter. Every one of our campuses is focused on it. The successes that I have reported today convince us here again that success is within our sights. So in the end, we come back to the headline, Massachusetts will not succeed unless public higher education succeeds. Massachusetts will not have the future that it needs unless public higher education achieves true excellence. We are encouraged by the fact that this message is getting through. The budget that public higher education received uh, during this past year with great support from the Boston Foundation, with great support from the business community, with a united effort all across this, the system was the best budget public higher education uh, has had in my lifetime. It was, we ranked in the top three or four in the country in terms of the percentage increase in funding for public higher education in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has never ranked at that level among the states uh, in terms of funding for public higher education. Our standing among the states improved from about 30th before last year's budget to about 23rd, 24th today. So we need to keep at it, but we are on our way. We are on our way educationally through all the work we're reporting in, in this Within Our Sites report, and we're on our way politically as indicated by the budget, we just need to keep on keeping on, and we will get there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I think you can all see why we have made these remarkable improvements. Uh, the leadership of Commissioner Freeland has been extraordinary. And uh, we at the Boston Foundation have enjoyed working with him for years and have particularly enjoyed working with all of you over the last several years as we all work together to put public higher education on the map and to continue this very positive trajectory up. Um, my name is Mary Jo Meissner. I'm Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs here at the Boston Foundation. It's my pleasure to serve as your moderator this morning and to welcome back many of our friends from the public higher education community. We've had lots of opportunities over the last several years to engage. Uh, and most recently, I feel like we kind of have a forum or a reception every other month, so it's kind of nice to welcome our friends back. So um, at this point, I'd like to um, ask our panelists to come up on stage uh, so I can formally introduce you, and then we can begin our discussion. So uh, we have three distinguished leaders from our public higher education system with us here this morning, uh, each one representing a, a different segment of the system. Uh, to my immediate right is Barry uh, M. Maloney, who is the 11th president of Worcester State University, uh, which he started in July of 2011. 
Prior to joining WSU, Maloney served for nearly 20 years at Westfield State University in a variety of positions, including twice as interim president and as vice president of student affairs and vice president of advancement and community relations, or college relations, excuse me. He's a native of Springfield, and he graduated from the University of Maine at Orono with a bachelor's in political science. Um, he also has a master's degree in public administration. Uh, and he is a 2007 graduate of the Institute for Educational Management um, at Harvard School of Education. Uh, to his right is Marty Meehan, who's been the chancellor of the University of Massachusetts at Lowell uh, since 2007. Prior to being named chancellor, many of us do know uh, Marty Meehan, who represented the 5th Congressional District of Massachusetts in the House of Representatives from 1993 to 2007. He served on the Armed Services and the Judiciary Committees. And pr prior to that, he was Massachusetts Deputy. Deputy Secretary of State for Securities and Corporations, and he was the first Assistant District Attorney of Middlesex County. He graduated cum laude from UMass Lowell in 1978, so he's returned to his alma mater. Um, and he's earned a master's degree in public administration from Suffolk and a Juris Doctor from Suffolk University Law School. And next to him is Dr. Ira Rubenzahl, who's president of Springfield Technical Community College. He's been president to 2004. Uh, prior to being named president of Springfield Tech, Dr. Rubenzahl was president of Capital Community College in Hartford, Connecticut from 1996 to 2004. He received his PhD in physics from MIT and his bachelor's in mathematics from Princeton. Dr. Rubensaw has been an extremely active member of the Springfield community and has multiple uh, memberships and relationships with community organizations there. Uh, so this is our uh, very distinguished panelist and I appreciate you being with us uh, this morning. Um, I think what we'd like to do is ask each one of uh, you gentlemen to um, give us an example of why your campus um, in particular, but then also if you could also talk about the segment of the university system that you represent is moving the needle on the vision project goals uh, overall. Um, we had heard in the video about how we need to make a habit of excellence. Um, there's some incredible stories in the new vision project report which you will receive if you haven't already on the way out. And um, these gentlemen have some really interesting stories to tell about what's happening. But this notion of making a habit of excellence. Uh, so I think um, I'm just going to go down the row and start with you, President Maloney. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, Mary Jo, for uh, that nice introduction. And uh, thank you to the Boston Foundation for, for having me. Uh, Worcester State is a, is a wonderful institution. It happens to be an institution in, in the second largest urban area in the Commonwealth, and uh, when I arrived in 2011, it was an institution that was on the rise with regards to some of the things that the Vision Project has outlined. However, our, our achievement numbers, our, our overall quality numbers were certainly not where they needed to be. Uh, with the help of the Vision Project grant that we received in, in 2011, we were able to coalesce and create our Succeed in Four campaign on campus, which has been about really in, in, uh, at its core about college completion. Through that campaign, generally speaking, we have focused on uh, in intensive advising, cleaning up of course scheduling, uh, uh, coming up with tracking software. We use a Starfish product that is a, a, a piece of software that allows us to track our students, not just in the first year, but throughout all four years of, of their time at Worcester State, so that we make sure that we know immediately when students are off track and, and have gotten off base. Uh, so that we can see uh, improvement and have seen improvements about six percentage points over the past two years in our college completion, our college graduation rates due to that Succeed in Four campaign. And it really has been, uh, behind the scenes, has been the Vision Project grant and the Vision Project that has helped to coalesce our campus towards these, these efforts. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, Boston Foundation for your support of the Vision uh, Project and uh, also Commissioner uh, Richard Freeland, who's been a friend for a number of years, and uh, we are really excited to be participating in this uh, from the University of Massachusetts perspective. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, and Freeland Rabowski talks about changing the culture of an institution. 
Uh, what we did at Lowell, first and foremost, we developed a strategic plan. We engaged the faculty, engaged the deans, engaged the department uh, chairs, and, uh, and during that process of establishing where we wanted to be in 10 years, uh, the question came up, how are we going to measure how we're doing? We need, need to be able to measure metrics and see that we're moving in the right direction. So we identified uh, those areas, much of them in line with what the Vision Project has identified for all of uh, public higher education in Massachusetts. And uh, for example, uh, we decided that we wanted uh, to increase student success rates. We wanted uh, uh, students to graduate on time. We looked at our freshman success rate, which uh, when I got to low was about 75%. Well, that means that there are 25% that don't become sophomores. And uh, as many of you know, if you lose somebody in the freshman year, there is a chance that they might never get back to a college or university again. It's fundamentally important to everything that we do. So uh, we went about a program to uh, get our freshmen into community uh, learning experiences where we had cohorts of students that took uh, three or more courses, the same courses together. Uh, we uh, developed um, a process by which a faculty member in that major would become a, a student mentor. We gave them a stipend to do that, and we got them engaged in study groups. We got them together, and they basically connected with a faculty member in their major much earlier, but also they were connected to other students who were also freshmen taking the same courses, in many instances uh, the same major, and they studied together and they learned together. We also developed, uh, had developed at Lowell more housing. When I got to Lowell, it was a 25% commuter, 25% uh, of uh, students lived on campus, 75% commuter. Why do we want students to live on campus? Because statistically, there's a higher likelihood of academic success for a student who lives on campus. What's more than that, we em embrace these learning communities and said we need living learning communities so that students who come and live with us will be housed in the same area of other like majors, taking the same type of courses. We'll get our student life and residence life uh, folks engaged with the academic process in the, uh, of the freshman year, and, and that worked extremely well uh, for us, and there was a dramatic improvement there. Our early warning signals, I think one of the most important things that any college or university has developed, has to develop, is an early warning system for when students are in trouble. Because oftentimes, it isn't until students are, uh, are buried underneath the quicksand do, do university officials figure out this student needs help. You can use technology uh, to do that. We developed a computer program to do that. It's worked extremely well. We've also uh, developed, we believe, in co-op, experiential learning for our students. And the Vision Project provided us uh, with a grant so that we were expanding research opportunities uh, for our freshmen. Um, one other thing that we've, we've, we've done a lot of other things, but the other thing that we've, we looked at particular courses in particular majors. You go to a calculus, for example. Uh, when I got there, uh, there were 65%, 62% of students in Calculus 101 that are flunking calculus. And you go to see the faculty who've been, been there a long time, and we say, sit down and they say, look, we got 62% of the students flunking calculus. The faculty members say, Yes, they are. This is a tough course. Sixty-two <laughs> percent. That's what flunked here. Yes. Well, gee whiz. Why do you have two hundred students in a class in calculus? If you look at the uh, the studies that are available, we found that when you reduce the number of uh, uh, students in a class in a subject like physics, physics or calculus, um, they can do a lot better. Why don't you put some of these courses, uh, have the lectures so they're available either by audio or video, so if a student misses, there's all kinds of data to suggest this is really how students learn these complicated subjects. So we, uh, you know, we said, why are there 200 in the class? Well, we have our best lecturers and it costs more money. That's an area we'll make the investment of resources so that we reduce uh, the class um, uh, faculty ratio. Uh, bottom line is our, our student success rate for freshmen has gone from 75% to this year it was 84.3%. And those of you who follow, this is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's a difficult thing to do and it takes time. So, but once you start doing that, your graduation rates go up, retention rates go up. We found that we're losing students from the sophomore to the junior year, so we made an investment in student life. Uh, you, you have to have higher quality 
student life opportunities. We double the number of clubs so that uh, we're much more diverse. Seventy-four percent of our new students are from diverse backgrounds. Well, the same clubs that you've had when you weren't such a diverse campus aren't going to work when you now have a diverse campus. So there are a lot of other things that we've done, but, but basically it's been a commitment that our faculty and our deans have had. The Vision Project has been instrumental in getting us, and there are a lot of other things we can talk about, but getting us in terms of our collaboration with Middlesex Community College and other places. We're doing a, not, a lot of nationally uh, uh, significant work that makes us a national model. Thank you, Chancellor. Dr. Rubenzahl. Uh, good morning, and I want to recognize the Boston Foundation, not just for this work, but you helped launch our Achieving the Dream activities, which got us a jump start in these kinds of uh, issues. We started our Achieving the Dream work in 2007, and before that date, there was no data on our campus about uh, gaps, achievement gaps between ethnic minority students and, and our white students. And when we looked at that, we weren't surprised that there was a significant gap. So we began to address that. And one of the things we did was set up an academic advising center. 70% of our students who enter the college uh, place into developmental English or developmental math. All those students now have a, an advisor, full-time advisor who has a caseload and follows those students. And over the last uh, three years, we've really closed the achievement gap between black Latino and white students, which was at 20, the retention gap was at 20%, it's now at 5%, it's gone up each year. White, the white, quite frankly, the white retention has stayed the same, but black and Latino has, has increased. I want to talk a little bit about mathematics, because I think that's my background, and I think it's, for the community colleges, a really, really critical issue. Mm -hmm. uh, of those students who are placing into developmental math and English, it's primarily mathematics that is the barrier. Um, so one of the things we did, we took a look at our math curriculum. It turned out that our calculus courses were meeting six hours a week. And we have very good success in calculus. They're small groups. They do, their students do very well. Our developmental math students were meeting three hours a week. And I said, what's wrong with that picture? Why are, why are the students who are most in need getting less instruction than the students who are taking calculus? So we began a pilot, which has grown each year, of taking our developmental math students and giving them six hours of instruction. And the model is basically um, that they get three hours of what I would call more traditional instruction and three hours of what a project-based learning, which comes out of an organization in California. What is project-based learning? It's very simple. Um, it's a series of exercises where the students actually uh, do a project using mathematics. So a very simple one in arithmetic is you, you uh, create a blueprint for a house that you want to build. Now, when you create a blueprint, there's a ratio between the size of the, of the units that you lay out the blueprint and the actual construction of the, the actual building that you're constructing. So the students have to go through a whole series of ratios and proportions to do this. But it's a project. It really, they really begin to understand about ratios and proportions by doing this. This is what we do in our very, very first course. So we've raised, in those courses, we've raised the um, uh, success rate, the pass rate, from 60% roughly to 80%. But I have to tell you, this is twice as expensive as what, we were, what we've been doing. And we have an enormous number of developmental mathematics courses. So only about 20% of our courses are now, are now uh, using this model. So when the commissioner says we need to go up to scale, that is really, really critical. All right, let me just say one other thing about uh, community colleges. We have 100,000 students at community colleges in Massachusetts. We have 50% of all students in the Commonwealth, and we have the majority of black and Latino students. Mm -hmm. This is typically the entry point for our black and Latino students uh, in the Commonwealth. This is true nationally also. And we, uh, we need to make our colleges more affordable. Um, in all due respect to the increase we got this year, which was very, very helpful for us, we froze, we're all, all segments froze uh, tuition, but our tuition and fees at the community colleges, $5,117 on average, is the fourth highest in the nation. It's not the 23rd highest, it's the fourth highest in the nation. We get about $3,000 from the Commonwealth per student. We get about, we, our students are paying about $5,000. 
So we've got to do a better job at making college more affordable to our students. These are the poorest students in, in, in higher education. Uh, let me give you another fact. $5,550. $5,550. That's what the maximum Pell Grant is. So if our students are paying on average $5,117, there's not much of a gap. They're going to reach that Pell limit. And with books, they basically get the Pell limit. In fact, if you look at our community college, I know at our campus, the number of students taking out loans in the last five years has jumped from 8% to 24%. So I'm very, very concerned about affordability. And we're making some important steps. I think the Vision Project has really highlighted this issue. And I hope we can make more steps because uh, we're going to, this is very, very important to our students. So, Dr. Rubenzell, you're the, I think you're the new president of the President's Council for the community colleges in the state. So, to the issue of how, how has the Vision Project, or is it, helping you work together over the 15 college camp, community college campuses to work collaboratively on some of these goals? Um, and measures, because part of it needs to be done individually, campus by campus, but I would imagine part of it needs to be accomplished uh, across the segment. I was just joking with my chair of my board yesterday. I said, I have a new part-time job that doesn't pay anything, being president. <laughs> and he said, oh, I have one too. He's chairman of the board that doesn't pay anything either. Um, let me talk a little bit about mathematics as an example. Um, I think the Vision Project has, has uh, focused our efforts across the 15 schools uh, around this issue of mathematics, for example. There's a new report from the Board of Higher Education that basically uh, tries to deal with two issues, if I can simplify. One is the placement issue. So too many of our students are placing in developmental math. We think there are ways around that, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the vision project, uh, the report deals with that. But the more important issue, I think, is that nationally, people have figured out that the traditional college mathematics curriculum, and I'm a product of that, is a STEM-based curriculum. So it really leads to calculus. It's pre-calculus and then calculus. But most students don't need calculus. For example, our nursing students, uh, and we have every, all 15 community colleges have a uh, uh, ADN nursing pr uh, program that, that turns out RNs. We turn out about 85 to 90 a year. They really need uh, statistics. That's what they really need. They don't need calculus. They're not going to do calculus on their patients, but they need to know uh, some statistical information. Mm -hmm. So we need to change the mathematics curriculum. Now, looking at my senior colleagues, it's not enough for us to change it. You've got to accept it <laughs> because our students are going to want to transfer. So this is a big issue. I think it's, it's, it's the Vision Project has really highlighted it, and I'm hoping we can make some progress Great. on this in the next Great. year. Can Chancellor Mead. Can I just yeah. comment that it really is fundamentally important? And when I got to Lowell, when the, in, I was three weeks in the job, and one of the first things I did, I called Carol Cowan at Middlesex Community College, and I said, what's with these transfers? It seems that they're not going as well as they ought to be. And she said, you know, Marty, we can transfer credits to BC or BU easily, more easily than we can to UMass Lowell. And it's one of the first things that we got to. So uh, I think this is fundamentally important because uh, Lowell, for example, our average SAT score is, is up 63, 64 points, math, verbal combined. We're tougher to get into, but we're still as accessible because we're going to rely on the community colleges because a, a student that comes from uh, whether it's Springfield or Middlesex or Northern Essex or any of the community college that's su successful is more likely to graduate on time than a student we accept even with the high SAT scores at the university. So I think we need to get at this. This is fun. We've made a lot of progress, but this is an area where, where we have a lot more work, I think, to do. Uh, President Maloney, can you talk, uh, I think you may want to jump on that, but also uh, how collaboratively the state universities are working together on vision project goals. Yes, th thank you. And I, and I would like to just dovetail on the, on the points made by my senior colleagues to the right. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been called we senior. We put them in the middle for that. <laughs> I'm not usually called senior by anyone. Uh, <laughs> um, we re I represent the segment of our system where 50,000 students reside over nine campuses and over 90 percent of our, those students come from within the commonwealth at worcester state alone 96 percent of our students come 
from the Commonwealth, and 75% of them come from central Massachusetts. So many of these students have walked through the doors of a local community college, and it become, it become, it's very apparent to all of the state university presidents that we make sure that we have alignments that are in place so that for the student, that they, at the end of their ter time, that they are not graduating with an excess of 120 credit hours. That costs them time, it costs them money, it keeps them out of the workforce, and quite, quite frankly, it's a, it's a burden on our economy. And, and, the, and the work that we have done primarily with QCC and Mount Wachusett to make sure that those pathways are, are open, all of our sister institutions have been working co collaboratively with community colleges to make sure that, that program articulations are, are, are in sync and, that, and, and there's a common course numbering project that's going on across the state that will help to ensure that a, an English class at Springfield Technical Community College can transfer to the four-year school and, and, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, it's the, the beneficiaries here are the students and so that they are able to enter the workforce with the appropriate amount of credits, with the appropriate amount of debt, and the appropriate amount of time. So President Cowan would probably say now it's much easier to transfer to UMass Lowell than it is to BC, is that, yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, the issue of state funding because uh, it's one we all deeply care about. Uh, and Chancellor Mean, I'm going to go to you about this because you've had a distinguished career in Congress uh, in the public sector. What I, don't, I don't miss it at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe you can tell us how can we, uh, with that in your background, what can we all do to keep this positive change going? It's a good change, but, you know, it's not... I wouldn't say it's historic. Or it's, it's one year. It's it, one year. It's literally one year. So I, I, think, I think Paul had a lot of great things to say, and Richard has. Uh, the whole premise of the vision project uh, is that uh, we want to be held accountable, and, and on that basis, we're going to seek more state funding. Oftentimes, you know, I had the Speaker of the House at my uh, campus recently, and he's kind of committed to do the same thing next year. And, and his premise is, tell me why this isn't put, put, putting money down a, down a black hole somewhere. Tell me what you're doing with it. Um, to put it into perspective, we're, we're, we're probably, I don't want to jinx us, but we pro with a high likelihood, we're going to get this funding again this year. It'll bring us back to where our funding was when Mitt Romney was governor, mm -hmm. literally. This is a long-term project, and it's one of the reasons I believe so strongly in the Vision Project. <laughs> We have to have accountability and show them that we're making the investments that we need to make in order to get this funding. Where does it come from? I, I thought it was articulated very well. Political leadership in this state, whether it's Democratic or Republican, doesn't matter, has viewed public higher education as a safety net for either people who aren't smart enough to get into private institutions or don't have enough money to get into the private institutions. Richard outlined beautifully how that paradigm has changed dramatically. Go over and look at, he mentioned North, look at Tufts and who they take from in-state. Look at any of these institutions and what they take from in-states. Or then you go to some of the other much more mediocre private institutions, and frankly, they're not going to get our workforce where they need to be. 88% of the graduates from UMass as a system stay here short term. So I think we need to demonstrate that we're performing at a high level. Um, when I, br I had the Senate president, I, I mean, I bring them to my campus and I show them they were, we're actually statistically performing better than most private institutions in New England. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the Vision Program uh, Project is all about. It's, at Lowell, we achieved an awful lot at the same period of time they were cutting our budget. Some things you can do, and the Vision uh, uh, Project outlines this very well, uh, keep early intervention, uh, putting students into cohort, uh, cohorts of other students with, with the same major. There are some things that you can do by changing a culture at an institution that actually doesn't cost money. So I think what we need to demonstrate in public higher education is, you know, whether we're funded or not, we are gonna, we're going to achieve excellence in everything that we do. And if we do that, they'll fund us. If the evidence shows that we're making improvements, they'll fund us because we, we can make the case. Richard has outlined it. We're an innovation economy. You need a highly skilled workforce. Anyone that doesn't get that doesn't belong in leadership positions. So I, that's how I think we do it. We demonstrate excellence. President Maloney, do you have some thoughts about how can we, how can we keep on this positive path of funding? 
Well, I, I, I would just echo what, what the Chancellor said, and I think that is we have to show the people in the Commonwealth that we're continuing to be a, a good investment. And I think we have been a good investment. I think we, as, as higher ed professionals, could probably do a better job, and I think the Commissioner has led us in this effort to, to market the good work that's going on and, and, to, and to put that into a way that people can understand what our priorities are and where, where we're headed in the future, and that's why uh, the, the vision project has been so powerful in, in our system, and I think it will continue to be that way moving forward. Uh, planning and accountability are, are going to be uh, conversations that happen on every college campus in this, in this Commonwealth for the, for the near term and the long term future because we know that uh, accountability is important, again, for, for, our, for our students' health and their success. So, Dr. Rubenzel, let me take that uh, in a slightly different way in terms of the funding issue and talk about developmental education. Uh, because I think there's a feeling that there's a lot of money going into developmental ed across the entire system, but it perhaps does not need to be, and that there's resources that could be recouped from that if we had uh, a different approach maybe a scaled approach, maybe some creative new ways of dealing this, but at the foundation we're talking a lot about developmental education and how can we help the system overall move in a different direction there. And I think this is something you, uh, my sense is that you really care about. Well, it's certainly true that if more of our students could place out of the developmental sequence or place higher in the developmental sequence, they have a much higher chance of completing their degrees, which is what we're ultimately trying to do. And we are putting a fair amount of resources into developmental education, although, quite frankly, we still do it on the cheap. I don't know how else to say it. It's still not the kind of resources that really are demanded. Um, but yes, you're right, that this is, this is probably the most important problem in uh, the community college uh, system. Is, is how, can we can we uh, reform developmental education to get more to, to have fewer students actually enter it, and to have more students who do enter it uh, succeed? Uh, can I just say something about the funding? Of course. Um, so, the Great Recession has changed the landscape, however, for us. I, I want to be I want to be uh, somewhat realistic about this, and the reason it's changed the landscape is that before the Great Recession. We had opportunities, especially at the community colleges, to raise tuition and fees and still be below that Pell number. That opportunity is gone. We have raised tuition and fees because we had all these cuts from the state and we had to deal with uh, increased costs and increased number of students. So I'm really concerned. I think the funding issue is more critical today than it's ever been because of our lack of ability to continue to raise, uh, raise charges on students. Um, there's another kind of cut at some of the resource issue that I understand that the, uh, the system is undertaking. And President Maloney, um, the state universities and the community colleges have, have formed something called PACE, the Partnership to Advance Collaboration and Efficiencies. And I guess you're all working together across those two segments uh, to reduce operating costs and to, you know, think about ways that you can collaborate and do maybe, I don't know, back office sharing, things like that. Is there, can you tell us about that? And do you think there's, um, there's some real possibilities for real savings there that we could then move over into educational parts of the system? Uh, Mary Jo, thank you for raising that. Uh, and the PACE initiative, uh, and thank you for reminding me what PACE stands for, by the way. We're a, prof <laughs> a, a profession of acronyms. Uh, <laughs> Um, the PACE initiative has already uh, s seen some fruit uh, borne by the work that's been done across the, the, the community colleges and the state universities. This past year, we saved over $2 million across the state in looking at ways of doing business, transacting business where we can collaborate and show some efficiencies. Uh, this this come year coming forward, we are taking another step, and that is uh, the, in, in late in the spring, we looked at our IT infrastructure. We had brought in an outside consultant with the help of the commissioner. Uh, a group called Barry Dunn out of, I believe, Portland, Maine, came in and, and met with every campus around the Commonwealth and looked at what, what was going on in relative to the campus IT infrastructure and has made 15 recommendations moving forward that the campuses will now begin to digest and work towards to try to, again, 
increase, take that $2 million in savings and grow that because those, those dollars saved, as, you, as you've indicated, uh, return back to the students. The, IT is not the only area that we're looking at. We're looking at our campus bookstores. We're looking at human resource savings, purchasing savings. But it is, it is a way for us to save dollars with the same level of funding that we've been receiving. It is about trying to do business a little bit more smartly and a little differently. And using technology as a way to, to change business practices uh, for the better. We, we've been doing that within the UMass system. Um, our our uh, efficiency and effectiveness uh, effort has been within all the campuses, looking at a lot of the same issues, I think, that Barry kind of outlined. But there are other areas as well. We've increased our enrollment at Lowell by about 40%. That has necessitated us to become more efficient in terms of making use of the facilities that we have. And that oftentimes means uh, there are more classes uh, that start at 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. The campus uh, is pretty uh, full on Fridays. So you get teaching loads and you spread them out. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things are challenging. Faculty members like to teach on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so uh, uh, we have two summer sessions. We now offer required courses in the summertime uh, because, number one, it's a way if we have a student that does a co-op overseas, they can come back and make up their time during the summertime. But it's also a more efficient use of the fact that we have these buildings in place. We have evening classes. We have to maximize the facilities that we have and constantly be looking to do that. It's another way that we get credibility uh, with the state or federal government uh, that we are maximizing uh, the resources that we have. So I think efficiencies in it being effective in terms of the resources we do have is critically important. So uh, one of the issues that uh, the Coalition for Community Colleges, which was a coalition that uh, the Boston Foundation was very involved in, um, focused on the most was workforce alignment. Uh, and Dr. Rubens, I, I think there's a much more, uh, there's a better understanding at the state legislature about that. Um, and how, what's the progress that's been made on that and what are some of the examples? We know each one of the, the college is themselves were working on lots of workforce programs and training, but let's talk about this issue of alignment across the 15 colleges as well and um, what's happened over the last year in, in terms of, of that so that we can produce the workforce that, that our employers are, are asking for. Well, I think uh, workforce alignment is in our DNA because community colleges traditionally run career programs. And if our students don't get jobs, there's no point in us running those programs. Um, it was alluded to it earlier, the $20 million DOL grant. This is, I believe, the first major grant that the 15 colleges cooperated on. And it's all about uh, workforce alignment. But let me give you an example of the model we've developed in a number of the campuses. Um, Manufacturing was mentioned by the commissioner. And it's true that the number of jobs in manufacturing have gone down. But manufacturing is still an important sector in the Massachusetts economy. But the jobs are very different. High school diploma doesn't count anymore. Um, so these manufacturers are using, they're capitally intensive manufacturers. That's how they can compete with places like China and India. The machines that they're using cost a half a million dollars to a million dollars. Um, they're pretty amazing. These are CNC machines, computer controlled machines. Um, they don't want somebody using those machines who doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's a huge investment. So our program trains, educates students to run these machines and to, and to do the software necessary because the, the part is actually made on software. It then has to be translated. The software has to actually be translated to the machine. The machine then makes the part. Since I, when I came to the college in 2004, the local manufacturers through organizations like the chamber kept telling me, you're not turning out enough students. And we had actually seats on this program. We had a great program, but we had seats. I said, this is something's wrong here. The manufacturers want more, more, uh, more graduates. And by the way, these graduates make about $50,000 a year with benefits. They, mm -hmm. And they can make more with overtime. Um, so we worked, we, I, I realized that by ourselves, it was very difficult to solve this problem. So we worked with the manufacturers and the Regional Employment Board to create a marketing, basically a marketing campaign. We went through the Regional Employment Board. They went actually into the middle schools 
and began to talk about manufacturing as a career. As a result, our program filled up in a couple of years. In fact, it was filled up in, by June 1st, and we began to turn students away. And then the manufacturers wanted more graduates, and we went to the state, and we said, you've got to help us expand this program. So make a long story short, we've expanded the program. We've doubled the size of the program, effective September 1st. College invested $600,000. The state invested $1.2 million. We have all new machines, which we needed. We have an expanded lab. We have more capacity. We hired two, fa two additional faculty members. We now have six full-time faculty members. So we did this in concert with the manufacturing community. The curriculum is vetted by our manufacturers. They sent, not only are we sending our students who are coming out of high schools or coming out of the military through this program, but they're, we're doing incumbent training. So their own employees are coming through our program. And our colleges are doing this in a variety of, in a variety of programs. So I agree that this is very, very important. I think what's, what you were alluding to, though, is we need to have also a statewide perspective right. on this. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a statewide perspective on manufacturing, not just a, a Hamden County perspective, which is what we have. And through various, through various means, I think we're starting to get there. So for example, there's a new organization called MCADAM, and I can't remember what it stands for. The M stands for manufacturing, the D stands for design, I can't remember the rest of the initials, but this, it's, it's maybe it, President Malona. Do you know that one? <laughs> but McAdam, the I'm actually on the board. I should learn the initials. <laughs> but McAdam is the is is the new statewide uh, nonprofit uh, organization that's going to support manufacturing throughout the Commonwealth, and they're certainly going to be working with the uh, public four-year and the two-year colleges uh, to do that. So yes, I I, I agree with you about that. All right. Um, I'm going to ask each one of you, uh, as a final question, to tell us uh, what the other sectors in Massachusetts can do to make the Vision Project a success. Um, we're at the early years of this. Uh, we want five years from now to see quite a bit uh, different trajectory in some of these uh, data points and benchmarks. Uh, so the, the business community, the civic community, the nonprofit, the public sector, uh, what can we do? President Maloney, you, you know, one of, one of the funding uh, pieces this year uh, coming from the governor and help with the help of the legislature and the commissioner, which hasn't been talked about, was the internship incentive uh, piece or proposal. And that funding has allowed more of our students to get out into the workforce in, in, a, in a paraprofessional way uh, to provide those opportunities. And, and, and those enrich students' lives in two ways. One is it allows a student to give up those jobs that they're, that they're in to, to kind of help afford or put, put them through school so that they can get that paraprofessional experience. And two is that networking and, that, and those job skills. So I, I certainly would say from my point of view, uh, it is critically important for us to, at Worcester State and the State University system to continue to work with my colleagues here on the panel, but the colleagues in the business and community sector to enrich and expand the number of internship opportunities that are available cr across the Commonwealth mm -hmm. because that is something that, uh, regardless of the sector of, the, of higher ed system that we're in, those experiences are invaluable to jump-starting a student's career uh, pathway moving forward. Thank you. Chancellor. I'm, I'm going to take part of uh, what the Vision Project is looking at that, that is primarily has to do with the University of Massachusetts and that's research mm -hmm. and and I think that it's really important that folks in the state understand the University of Massachusetts is third in terms of research expenditures in Massachusetts behind Harvard and MIT and by the way we're not a distance to third we're very close to MIT right. our research Amazing. is critically important to economic development in this state we're creating uh, and much of the research focus on those technologies that have a high likelihood of commercialization. What does that mean? It means that we're focused on research over $600 million worth that, uh, that is going to result in the opportunities for spin-off companies uh, that, that, that provide licensing opportunities, but, but these companies will create and, and grow jobs. Many of our, our research is focused on solving many of society's programs. So I, I think uh, most people in this state well, a lot of people in the state probably uh, uh, don't understand the implications of a public research university and how, how dramatically important public research universities are to, to, to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I would say looking at UMass as a research engine, which it is, 
and, and then finding ways that we can co collaborate right. with foundations, with business and industry, and then selling that research institution. I mean, there's a reason why UMass costs the most to go to. It's, it's more expensive to hire research faculty. Our emerging technologies building that we just sent per square foot is very, very expensive space. I, I think we need to, to, to get together, collaborate more, and have people in Massachusetts understand what a public research institution is all about and how it literally drives the economy and drives uh, job creation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rubenzel. Yeah, um, in answering the question about the senior, my, my colleagues from the, from the uh, universities, um, I, I would focus on transfer. Mm -hmm. We do a good job with transfer, but I think the math issue is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not a matter of accepting credits. It's a matter of transforming the mathematics curriculum. Um, I was at a conference, uh, Achieving the Dream conference, actually, in last February. And the state of, and, and this, was, this was a big topic, and the state of, of Texas got all the publics together, the community colleges and the public universities, and they have an agreement that, that solves this problem. Uh, so there's a, just to be specific, there's a, there's a stat way path. So if you're going to go into statistics, go into nursing, for example, you take one uh, sequence. If you're going to go into STEM, you take a different sequence. And they have agreement. They've done it. Now, if Texas can do it, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, part of the challenge here is when, uh, if, if I talk to Carol Cowan, she says, well, you know, your folks don't want to take this credit, that credit. Then I go to my faculty senate, and they say, well, we don't do it because of this or that. Basically, it's back to what Freeman talks about in the video. It's changing the culture of our institutions. I've found that uh, we've done a number of faculty events where we bring Middlesex faculty, Lowell faculty together, and we sort of talk about how we're collaborating, and then, you know, we can work on some of these issues. We do it at North Shore Community College. My provost is, is up in that part. We, we do an event at, at his home. We do an event with the... So I think it's about sort of breaking down these yeah. barriers, and that requires just changing the culture, getting faculty interacting with each other, and then getting the faculty senate to say, you know what, we've got to work. You know, we had meetings over at the community colleges. Let's change this a little bit. And, and I think that we're beginning to do that, but it doesn't change quite as quickly as we'd like to have it change. So um, now I'd like to take the prerogative of the uh, moderator, and, and because we are in Boston at the Boston Foundation, and acknowledge our two new uh, Boston Community College presidents who are here with us this morning. I, I think we've acknowledged them here three times now <laughs> over the last couple of months, but it's a pleasure again to uh, welcome Pam Ettinger from the uh, Bunker Hill Community College and Valerie Roberson from Roxbury uh, Community College. And I, I don't mean to put you on a spot, but just really, uh, if you could give us each a, a quick headline on um, how you as new leaders of your institutions here in Boston are going to drive change through the Vision Project. I'm sure you heard about the Vision Project as soon as you got here, so um, what do you think? Valerie, uh, please stand up and tell us your quick headline. Well, first of all, thank you um, for your kind welcome, and I've, I've had so many kind welcomes since I've been here in Boston. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, um, you know, one of the things that I did um, that was a little unique, I understand, was I had the opportunity to meet with Commissioner Freeland as a part of my interview process. And I shared with him that I had um, done some studies of Boston and, and Massachusetts, and I was really impressed with the work um, that was already started with the Vision Project. Um, one of the things that it provides is that focus. And so just as an example, um, we were uh, fortunate enough to receive funding um, on a project that really was centered on um, college participation and college completion. We teamed up with our high school um, that was closest to us, Madison Park, um, providing opportunities for those students to take college-level courses while they were still enrolled in high school, and then um, also partnering with uh, UMass Boston to ensure that students who completed uh, Roxbury had an opportunity to then um, transfer seamlessly to that institution. But when we looked at those things, we could not help but look at the other um, four 
goals in the vision project, um, it became quickly apparent that we had to focus on um, closing the achievement gap. And um, we started conversations with our high school principal about what we could do to better support students to understand what they needed in order to avoid taking those developmental classes. And so it sparked conversations, um, faculty to faculty, to better understand how we can align curriculum. Um, and then, of course, um, we've had um, a lot of support from the business community to say, well, you know, if you're gonna focus students, um, how can you better serve um, the workforce needs that we have in Boston? And so we started to make sure that uh, we were better defining um, curriculum pathways and um, what students would need to be able to um, transition through that um, pathway. So it's, it's been my pleasure to start this work and, and I can't tell you how exciting it is to have that focus and to understand what the goals are and know that we can achieve them together. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pam. So one of the greatest fears I have is that I've given this speech before and some of you have heard it already. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, the, in the editorial that, was, um, that appeared in the Globe this weekend, it said, well, you know, when all the greetings and the handshaking's over, Valerie and I have got to buckle down and get to work. <laughs> well, I would like to tell the community that the greeting and the handshaking is part of the work. What, is, what, I, what I did not hear mentioned today is our K-12 partners. Part of our work is to go out and shake the hands of our K-12 partners and align our curriculum and make sure that the students who come to us have either college credits or is going into college level work. That is the only way to do it. And then I'm going to go and shake the hands of the chancellor and the president uh, in, the, in the near future so we can send students to you who are ready. Um, I think the community colleges, me and my 14 colleagues, have a very special role in that we are the only segment of higher education where we allow everyone to come but we don't let them go until they're ready. And that is a special kind of work. Um, we are at Democracy's College, the community colleges, because we do take everyone and we are the opportunity. But I swear we're not gonna give them to you until they're ready. So that's gonna take a little bit of work. It is leadership intensive, and I can, I can tell on the faces of my 14 colleagues um, that moving the faculty into innovation, giving them information, and having them have impact, like the tagline of the Boston Foundation, um, is hard work, and it takes not hours, not months, sometimes it takes years. And it takes a lot of white hair, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, and the other piece is, is that it is also labor intensive. We talked a lot about leadership today and about the community, but ultimately it comes down to the student in the classroom and their teacher. And I would like to acknowledge that today because that is where the work is getting done. And it's really intensive work. And that human element is what makes it successful. So thank you for the opportunity um, to, to do this work, and thank you for the Boston Foundation and supporting it and supporting innovation and information and impact. <laughs> and I would like to thank the commissioner for giving us the Vision Project language by which we can organize. The Vision Project is one of the reasons why I came to Boston. Oh, so. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to move to the question and answer portion of our program, and we've got some microphones, and if you could uh, raise your hand, I'll identify you, identify yourself, and please give me a, a question, not, not a uh, statement. So um, <laughs> over here, we have Gary, I believe it is. Um, if you could get a microphone there. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Uh, Gary Kaplan, I'm executive director of JFY Networks. Uh, we work with some of the community colleges and with high schools on preparing kids to avoid developmental courses. There's been a lot of talk this morning about the problem of developmental education. Uh, for the past, since 1998, the mechanism that decides whether students go into developmental courses or not has been a college board product called the Accuplacer. It's been mentioned a few times this morning. There's a lot of discussion now about whether there should be a new standard or no standard or how developmental education should be uh, handled. Uh, I'm wondering if there is any discussion about uh, changing that, uh, the use of the Accuplacer, discontinuing it, or shifting to another instrument. Mm -hmm. um, is, there any, uh, is there any information about that? Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if Dr. Rubensaw wants to answer it, and then I, the yeah. commissioner, if you'd like to say something as um, well. On, yeah. All right. Go, go ahead, commissioner. <laughs> commissioner, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. <laughs> So do we have a microphone I'm, for I'm the, historian the commissioner? The crowd, the uh, do you have a microphone? Oh, he's got one. Do I, do oh, I have one? one? No, they took it off. Actually. No, no, it's on. No, it's on. <laughs> I have it. Oh. oh there you go. <laughs> uh, so I, I refer to the report on math developmental education that is currently under consideration by the Board of Higher Education. This directly addresses that issue. Uh, what it fundamentally does uh, is uh, launch our system of public higher education across all three segments on a period of experimentation where we're giving campuses the opportunity to try other approaches to placement. It's the first step, as, uh, as Ira, Ira mentioned, for example, using high school GPA as an alternative to AccuPlacer if in the judgment of, uh, of the faculty uh, at, the, at the campus that high school GPA merits direct placement into credit-bearing courses. One of the things we found about AccuPlacer is, is that it is not a particularly good predictor of success in, a credit, in the first credit-bearing course. Uh, there's wonderful research coming out of Columbia University, which has shown that if you take two students, both of whom take, have the same score on, on the AccuPlacer and therefore place into a developmental course, and one of the students takes that course and the other doesn't, and they both end up in the first gateway math course, the likelihood of success is about the same. The fact that they've gone through medial education has had zero impact on their likelihood of success in that, in that first course. Uh, this, is, this is an area of a lot of uh, experimentation still. I think we, the, the fundamental thing we know for sure is that what we're doing right now is broken. To give you a sense of the numbers, uh, uh, the most recent numbers, 10,000 students entering one of our campuses, placing into remediation, only 2,000 of those 10,000 ever completing the first credit-bearing course. 8,000 students falling by the wayside. That is simply un un unacceptable for all the reasons that we have been talking about. So we need to find a more effective placement mechanism in this period of experimentation where we can use GPA as an alternative to AccuPlacer is the first thing. Uh, and then the, the second thing, and I, I agree with that, is the more profound thing is to offer students multiple pathways through college level mathematics and to get away from the notion that everybody has to be ready to be an engineer. I, I understand that from a point of view of pure kind of intellectual horsepower from a mathematics perspective. But from a broader social perspective, in terms of wanting education to actually prepare students for what their life uh, prospects are going to be, what their life course is going to be, let's give them the math mathematics that they really need. You know, the, the truth is that for, for many of us, a much deeper grounding in statistics would have been more helpful than wrestling with calculus in high school, even though, like Ira, uh, I went through calculus, although not with the same success I have to. I, I, I have to. So I think we're, we're getting more thoughtful about multiple pathways. So those are the two big things that we're talking about. Not everybody agrees with this. It's controversial. We're taking time to, to work it through. But what we all know is that what we're doing now isn't working, and it's broken. It needs to be fixed, and we're on the case. Okay. Professor Maloney, did you want to say something? I, I just wanted to add very quickly two additional points. Is one, of course, it, it gets back to uh, many of our campuses at, at Worcester State, over 30% of our students are first-generation college students. So when those students are put into a remedial course, there's an added stigma to, the, to that. And, and, and with students whose psyche is already fragile as they're entering uh, college or university work, uh, to then to put them in a remedial course and, and, and stigmatize them as in a put, being put into a developmental course sends their confidence back. And the, the last point that I would make, of course, is the cost. It, that was raised earlier. Developmental courses cost money. They're not, those are courses that are typically not uh, making pathway towards graduation, so those credits don't count towards that 120 hours. We, the campus presidents know that. Uh, we, I took steps when I arrived at Worcester State to remove the AccuPlacer for the transfer students coming in. We actually had a process where transfer students still had to take the AccuPlacer exam, mm -hmm. and that was, that was extremely problematic. Uh, right here, Elise. 
Uh, my name is Elise Najimi. I run the Foundation to be Named Later, and we have 38 uh, young people on, on the Peter Gammons College Scholarship, and these are most of the young people that we're talking about, really uh, under-resourced young people, who first-generation college, and many of them go to your institutions. And my question to you is, I learned so much from them about their struggles, because we stick with them for the whole time. Um, that from freshmen to when they graduate, we give them a mentor. And I'm wondering what in the, I, I'm, I really like the Vision Project, and I wonder what role do the students have in the Vision Project and helping inform the goals and the strategies that you've put out there? Uh, Commissioner and anyone else? Uh, There's a, there's a student member of the Board of Higher Education. There's a student uh, advisory council that is a, a statewide uh, representative body of, of students. And we work closely with that body. So as we were developing the vision project, uh, everything was processed through those, through those, those student groups. And they, the students have been very supportive of this. I, th I think you know, the students understand that they, they need us to be excellent. They want us be excellent. They, they don't want us to be easy on them. They want us to get them ready for, for what the real demands that they're going to face uh, are. So the students have been very much our, our partners. And uh, you know, one of our messages to the students has been, this is, uh, yes, we need to work harder. We need to raise the level of our game. But this is a partnership with you guys. Uh, one example of this is the, uh, the way we're experimenting with the more strategic use of financial aid. You know, financial aid. Uh, particularly need-based financial pay, aid has basically been an entitlement. If you meet certain income requirements, you get the money. Doesn't make any difference whether you've prepared yourself for college or not. So you take, take two students, uh, one who's worked hard in high school, taken all the right courses, to get ready for college, and another student who's basically blown off high school, but graduated, they have the same financial situation, they get the same financial aid. We're saying, hey, wait a minute, what's, what's wrong with this picture? Let's say to the student, uh, you're going to get some financial aid, but if you really work hard and prepare yourself, and if once you're in college, you take a full load of courses, which is going to increase the likelihood that you'll graduate, you're going to get more financial aid. So can we use financial aid to strengthen the partnership between the institution and the students around getting this job done? So we want that message to go out to the students. At the same time, we want to hold ourselves more accountable. I just want to add one thing about, about this. Um, one of the things that's been successful in our campus is we do surveys, survey groups. We bring students together and we ask them, how did they succeed? In the old days, we used to always worry about the students who were leaving and trying to figure out why they left. I think it's more profitable to talk to the students who actually were successful. And what you find out is they have all kinds of great stories and strategies. And we then learn from them. And then we tell the incoming students, these are some of the strategies that successful students use. Mm. Chancellor? I, I think it's about changing the culture of an institution and actually listening to students. I mentioned some of the things that we do. We cohorts of students together and, and assign them faculty and get faculty engaged with them earlier. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we use technology to keep track of students. I mean, it's not because I don't have a lot of other things to do, but because I learn so much by, you know, by just listening to the stories of our students. And if you don't listen to the, you just have to listen. Faculty, you, you have to make sure faculty's listening. And from that, you know, you're a better, more effective institution. So I, I think once you change the culture of an institution, faculty, deans, they're listening to the incredible stories of their students, and they will be more effective at meeting uh, the requirements of the vision project, but, but turning out successful students. I mean, I, mm. I think that's the core of what we're doing. It's, it's what turns all of us on into our jobs. Um, doesn't, this is not working? <laughs> I think we got it. Okay. Um, I think what's at the core of Elise's uh, question as well is this issue of persistence and how uh, students do persist, uh, particularly students from more disadvantaged or first-generation backgrounds. And um, uh, Pam, I might just ask you to, to mention Single Stop, uh, which is a program that I know many of the college 
community colleges are interested in and that you have uh, underway at Bunker Hill? Uh, we're one of 12 colleges. not sure that might we, work. We, we are one of 12 colleges um, across the nation. Um, we're part of a demonstration project. And what the single stop does is that it provides um, learning, uh, financial literacy, but also emergency services. They become advocate for the students. So it's, it's a sort of a, a, a walk-in case management model. So if the students don't have enough money to ride the train that day, we try to come up with money for that emergency assistance. Um, and I think on most of our campuses, there's been a lot of focus and talk on curriculum and how students get through curriculum. The piece that's really key to a lot of the successes that we're seeing is actually that wraparound service. You know, what are you doing to coach the students to, to make sure that they're not hungry coming in in the morning and that they have money to ride the train and take care of their children while they learn, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, right back here, this gentleman here. Is that Andy? Andy, identify yourself. In okay, uh, I'm Andrew Sum with Center for Labor Market Studies at Northeastern. And what I'd just like to do, including President Favreeland to, to answer as well. Um, as a state, we have the best educated population in the country. We've been number one for at least 20 years. We've got the best educated labor force in the country, best. We have ranked number one with the number of jobs that are college labor market jobs in our state and we haven't created a net new job for 13 years. We have the worst job, fourth worst job creation record in the country. How do we reconcile those two? And one last thing, I noticed when we talked about the disparities we talked about by race, by ethnic, by income, those are real, but you didn't measure, mention gender, and gender disparities are at an all-time high. Why didn't we mention that? We need Jack in here to man up and recognize this problem is real, it's serious, and I didn't hear a word say about it, particularly among black and Hispanic groups. It's 210 women getting degrees for every 100 men. That's a disgrace. How are we going to deal with those problems? We'll turn to the commissioner for both of them. <laughs> Hey, he is from Northeastern. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you, you see what happens. I, 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 I used to be president of Northeastern, and Professor Sum was on that faculty. He never would have been quite so challenging to me when, I, when, when, when he was a member of the faculty. But now, I'm all, now I've moved on, and I, I have to face him. To, uh, the Center for Labor Market Studies is one of the great local resources. I, and Andy Sum himself is one of the great local resources. And this issue that he has uh, focused us on of gender discrepancy and in particular the, the challenges of young males in our society and particularly the challenges of young males of color in our society is, is absolutely profound. Uh, we have a group uh, within the framework of the Vision Project called the, the College Participation Advisory Group, Andy, uh, which is focused on the question of where do we really need to move the needle with respect to college participation? And the answer is, as you know, uh, young males of color. Uh, and so this year, we are beginning a whole strategy focused on precisely that, that issue. So thank you for raising our, our sights on that, but we are, we are on that case. On the broader issue of job creation, uh, you know, I, I, th I think what Chancellor Meehan talked about in terms of the role of the research university is certainly part of the answer. I, I, guess, I guess what I'd say is, you know, what is our job in public higher education? I think our, our job has been to do all we can to make sure that the workforce is here that can support the economy so that the lack of a workforce is not a constraint in job creation, but rather an asset so that when businesses are, think, are making the decision to move to Massachusetts or to grow and expand and stay in Massachusetts that have started here, they can know that the workforce is going to be there to support their their expansion and their growth and development. That is our educational job. We also do have a, a role to play in terms of new enterprise development, and so an aspect of the vision project that Chancellor Meehan talked about that uh, I didn't emphasize in my remarks is we need to be a national leader in research that drives economic development. We need to be a national leadership in translational research. We need to be a national leadership uh, in, the, in the turning of research into enterprise. 
uh, and that is something that, that UMass is very focused on and, and really has quite a spectacular record. So we are not the whole answer to the job creation equation by any means, but I think there are ways in which we can participate that I've described. I, I think part of the challenge there, and we've always had a focus at UMass Law on, on manufacturing, manufacturing processes. And in fact, we, we have one of only four National Science Foundation, as you know, National Science Foundation bio nano manufacturing centers in the country because it's a collaboration with Northeastern and UNH. Part of the challenge has been we develop manufacturing processes at, uh, at universities like UMass Lowell. And those manufacturing, manufacturing processes are successful, but during a period of time, it just seems that we lose in the United States, or we lose in Massachusetts, uh, manufacturing to other uh, places where they figure out how to manufacture inexpensively and it ends, it, you know, it, the textile industry went to the south and then it went overseas. That's a big challenge that we have to figure out in this country. And even with the research, even with developing the most cutting edge manufacturing processes, we've had a propensity to lose that manufacturing after a set period of time. Now one of the things that I say at Lowell is, look, if we have a niche in manufacturing that is closely connected to the development of these technologies and then eventually years after, after manufacturing processes become more inexpensive someplace else, at least that's a niche for us. But I think there's a broader issue here that you raise, and that is how do we keep these manufacturing jobs in Massachusetts and how do we keep them here in the United States? And that's um, something that would take more than the next five minutes of wrap up, but it's a major issue that we face here. And it's, by the way, I mentioned 88% of the students from UMass stay in Massachusetts short term. Long term, after more than five years, it's 66%. Why? Because of this issue. Mm -hmm. Going for jobs that are outside of Massachusetts, and that's why we lose a so many of our students because they just aren't the jobs here. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, and let's go way in the back, like, oh, the wall. Thank you. Uh, I'm Beth Anderson, and I run a small network of charter and non-charter public high schools, alternative high schools, that are designed with the goal to put young people in college, a lot of the young people that the commissioner um, referred to before that have blown out of high school. And um, I'm interested, I, I don't think that anything uh, has happened without some teeth in Massachusetts in terms of uh, real uh, systemic change. And MCAS is a good example. So, you know, whether we like it or not, MCAS has really changed the landscape. And I guess I'm, I'm deeply excited about the comments of the Boston-based community colleges about the collaboration with K through 12, especially high school, because if high schools are not part of this problem with developmental courses at your level, then we're not gonna be able to push anywhere. So I was wondering if um, particularly President Rubenzal uh, could respond and, and speak to um, kind of what what's happening at the state level or at the community college level to kind to stitch together some accountabilities with real teeth for high schools so that we and me being a, a high school provider are putting more students into your schools that are community college ready. Thank you, Beth. Um, so one thing that we're doing, I believe, in Massachusetts, we have six gateway to high school gateway to college high schools on our campuses. We have basically contracts with the local school districts, and we're taking dropout students, students who are potentially gonna drop out, and we're putting them through basically a developmental college sequence. They're getting their high school diploma, and then they're coming to us to finish their school. We have them at Holyoke, Mount Wachusett, Bristol, Massasoit, Quinsigamon, and STCC. So that's one thing we're doing. And that, by, by doing that, you do get a, a strengthened relationship with the local high school. But I want to be honest about this. This is very, very hard and very frustrating. Um, the urban high schools in particular, I'm speaking about Springfield perhaps, they are, they're not focused on this. I don't know how to say it. They're just not focused on this issue. And um, there needs to be, at the very highest state levels, there needs to be incentives and, uh, fo and focus and leadership to get the high schools to deal with this issue so when they come to us, that developmental gap is not there. Now clearly the park standards are one way to do that. That's the hope. Uh, but I'm not sure, I'm, I think individual community colleges have made some progress with local school districts, but I have to tell you in our area it's been very, very difficult. The other thing about, about the high school environment, just to, to mention, is that 
in, in Hamden County, we happen to have two community colleges, Holyoke and, um, and uh, SDCC. And in Western Mass, in the four Western Mass counties, we have four community colleges. There are probably, I don't even know, there are probably 90 high schools. So, you know, how do we, how can we possibly organize relationships with all those 90 high schools around this specific issue? It's very, very difficult. Uh, sure, I'm a commissioner. The importance of this park initiative, I, I mentioned, mentioned it briefly, but it is deeply, deeply important. It is a collaboration of K through 12 and higher ed in a way that's never happened before in the history of the state. We have come together to agree on a common standard of what college readiness is. And there will now be coming out of park, and as I said, we're rolling this out this spring, an, an 11th grade standard for performance in, in math and English, which we in higher ed agree uh, equals college readiness. And so if students meet that 11th, 11th grade standard, we are, we are ready to say the standard is still being developed, but uh, assuming it develops in the way we expect it to, We'll place that student directly into credit-bearing instruction without even being tested for, for, for remediation. And then the park standards reach way back to third grade. So we'll be able to say to, to families and to kids in third grade, you are or are not on track to be ready for college when you're in 11th grade. And we'll have the same capacity at, at fifth grade. And we'll have the same capacity at seventh grade and in ninth grade so that that message will be sustained. And that will be a common message from high school and, and higher ed. It's a revolutionary change. It will, it, if, if it works and we're hopeful about it, uh, MCAS will go away, AccuPlace will go away, and we'll finally, at long last, have a common set of metrics uh, jointly developed by higher ed and K-12 that lead directly from the grades uh, into college. It's a, it's a huge thing. Thank you. As you can see, we are in good hands here with these individuals, and I want you to uh, join me in thanking all of them, our panel, our commissioner, and our president. And uh, with that, I'd like Paul to come back here and close out. Uh, thank you, Mary Jo. I want to thank uh, Richard, our, our panelists, and all of you. It's been an extraordinary privilege for us to host this uh, incredibly important discussion this morning. There are big things happening in our city. As I said at the outset, I think this is a big thing, um, uh, too, a very big thing. And uh, if I had had any reservations, which I didn't, about our support of the Vision Project, uh, they certainly would have been uh, extinguished by the, the quality and depth of the conversation. Uh, it's just amazing what's, what's underway. The Vision Project is providing an envelope uh, for, I think, a revolutionary uh, process that, in fact, could vault us into national leadership in public higher education. And the, the, the metrics, uh, and I was struck by some of the discussion where clearly uh, if the presidents weren't too proud to say that th as a consequence of having to get on top of certain metrics, uh, you got to know your institutions better than you had before and uh, were able to do things that you... Uh, uh, hadn't imagined. I, I, I think that is incredibly powerful. And a kind of case has been made here this morning that is very, very powerful. I want you all to understand that in terms of what's at stake uh, and whether we support these institutions and whether they are excellent uh, or not. It's, it, it is the research, it's the transfers, it's the deep engagement with employers that Ira talked about. Um, and that case is being embraced by people outside of public higher education. And that's what was so important. We, we, you know, people have been very nice to thank, thank us, and we, we love that at the Boston Foundation. But you know, Bill Swanson, the CEO of Raytheon, fought for community colleges. John Fish of Suffolk Construction. Bob Kraft of the New England Patriots. Major business leaders started to help you make the case. And we've got to keep that going. We've got to keep that going. We've got we to burnish the case and, and perform. Uh, but we also uh, have to continue to recruit those independent, credible third-party folks who will provide a kind of testimony that, uh, that you can't provide yourselves. But I think we can do that. And uh, I'm very, very excited and, and grateful that uh, we're able to be uh, part of it. So have a great day, everybody. Thanks for being here.